Hi guys, welcome to this next Geek at Home webinar entitled How Google's New Hybrid Cloud Strategy Advancements Impact Stateful Workloads and Why IT and DevOps Teams Should Care. And I'm looking forward to this as a great topic. Uh, this is going to be sponsored by Robin IO. Uh, so if you get a chance, uh, check out those guys. But uh, we're going to have a great inside baseball discussion in terms of how multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, all this stuff really kind of works and plays well together and how containers are, in essence, providing us with the capabilities that we didn't have just a few years ago and how new technologies such as Anthos are really kind of changing the game. Can we have the next slide, please. So my name is Dave Lutick. I'm an analyst at Gigom Research and author, speaker, be list geek, do podcasts everywhere, do a lot of speaking on cloud computing and really have been focused on the hybrid and multi-cloud space for the last five years and enjoy talking to everybody about it and learning new information about it. And joining me is our special guest, uh, Radhish um, Menon, and he's a CMO, Rob and I.O. Uh, give us the uh, lowdown on you, Radhish. Radhish. Thanks, David. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, Radesh Menon, and CMO of uh, Robin.io. And I joined Robin uh, recently after uh, uh, a pivot on Kubernetes in August. Prior to Robin, I'd spent a little over uh, five and a half years at Red Hat, where I bootstrapped the OpenStack business. That was a very rewarding journey as well. And prior to that, um, at Microsoft, I've had the privilege of working with some world class products, including Windows Server, um, Azure, Hyper-V, et cetera. So excited to be joining you, David, in, in this discussion today. Yeah, I'm gonna ask a question at the beginning of the webinar instead of at the end. In your opinion, what is the most significant changes that occurred in the cloud space in the, in the last three years, given your kind of status in the industry? That's an excellent question. So I would call out uh, three things as uh, significant uh, when it comes to cloud. First is hybrid has become the norm when it comes to customers thinking about any kind of adoption plans, right? So, um, and it's no more uh, uh, a science experiment, you know, hybrid has been delivered and can be deliver delivered so much so uh, that customers are very comfortable um, embarking on that as a primary strategy. So it feels great to be, um, have been part of that you know, journey. Uh, in my own little way, I've been uh, part of the OpenStack journey as well as prior to that at Azure. So seeing where Azure has come, um, 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 as well as the top three, four cloud players jockeying very tightly to out innovate, to deliver on hybrid is a, um, a, a great development. The second I think is uh, the pace of innovation um, has dramatically um, improved in that it's almost impossible to keep track of uh, all the developments that are out there. And then David, you know, that clearly makes the role of someone like you in this space all the more important, I'm sure you would agree, right? So that would be my uh, second observation. I think the third um, observation is, given that hybrid is reality and the pace of innovation, we are at an interesting juncture where entire stacks are gonna be rebuilt around this cloud native construct, right? So and new players and new standards are in the process of uh, emerging. So that's a very exciting uh, space to uh, be in. All right, let's move to the next slide and let's get going. Great response. So what we're going to do in this webinar today is number one, we're going to better understand the state of the technology and what container native storage solutions bring to modern IT. And as you guys know, if you're deploying containers out there, uh, this is a large problem to solve. As I'm building systems, leveraging containers and container orchestration systems, and the new technology starts to come along, the ability to do stateful storage uh, is something I think that can't be underestimated. Understanding Google hybrid and multi-cloud strategies and explore new solutions that have been just been announced. Uh, I think we're talking about Google Next last, a couple of weeks ago. That may change the game in how you build, deploy, and operate containers. And then we're going to learn how to hide complexity while providing and maintaining richness, richness of capability. And then we're going to talk about best practices. And also at this time, you know, familiarize yourself with the GoToWebinar uh, dashboard or your, the, the controls there. And please ask questions during the webinar. We're not going to get to them until the uh, last few minutes. Uh, however, I think it's important that you kind of jot down what's important to you and how you're going to carry on. So the next slide, please. 
So we're going to start out by understanding the state of technology and what container native storage solutions bring to modern IT uh, going forward. So what's your take on this, Mahesh? Yeah, so um, if you could go to the next slide, actually, let's go to the meat of the discussion um, uh, from a technology perspective, right? Clearly, containers and the notion of DevOps are here to stay, right? Unless somebody has been hiding in a cave, uh, the notion that the very mission of several CIOs is structured around removing any friction in the path of developer productivity, right, is a reality that we are facing. So in that context, containers and Kubernetes have emerged as standards that organizations across the globe, you know, different verticals, uh, you know, just reflecting on some of the conversations that we had uh, recently at uh, Google Next itself, you know, be it developers or architects or CIOs, everybody is rallying around the fact that, look, the agility, efficiency, and portability of cloud-native technologies are the welcome change that is needed from an IT perspective. And the awesomeness that Kubernetes, uh, if I could use the superlative here, uh, it brings to the table is the fact that it has made ability to manage stateless workloads um, very easy, right? So that's the state of where we are today. But if you could go to the next slide, um, the, the reality when it comes to the enterprise workloads which involve state or they are data intensive, just reflecting on a conversation that I had at Google Next a couple of weeks ago, you know, one of the customers uh, walked up to me and said, look, we when embarked on a journey uh, of embracing Kubernetes a little over a year ago. We've gotten comfortable in bringing our stateless workloads, et cetera, but we do have some data that the uh, Kubernetes farm itself is generating, even if it's, you know, Prometheus data, or we also have MariaDB and some a couple of NoSQL databases, Postgres, et cetera, that are being onboarded, but they're not being protected today, right? So there is a concern around how do you make sure that data management capabilities that are required for protecting the most important data that's you know relevant for the enterprise is in place when you are bringing in the concept of DevOps and launch and learn um, is the key uh, uh, reality of the situation right now. Now, this all points to a need for a simple solution in that you need to think slightly different from the current set of storage offerings, which are bringing more of a volume level construct to addressing applications in Kubernetes space. But in a cloud native context, you need to be fundamentally thinking about applications and data together and not just at the data level, right? That's the fundamental difference in the landscape when it comes to container native storage and Kubernetes. So David, uh, from your observation, have you seen customers express um, uh, needs in this um, uh, regard? Yeah, this is obviously something, it's kind of an architectural problem that pops up each and every time. So, you know, and, and the thing is if we're moving towards dealing with complexity issues, and I write about, speak about that all the time, you know, we're dealing with some sort of an abstraction layer and instead of proprietary abstraction layers, you know, such as cloud management platforms and looking at Kubernetes, orchestration, Docker, things like that, that seems to be the way to go. But ultimately your ability to deal with data there has been a limiting factor and your ability to kind of understand what mechanisms are there that kind of will solve that architectural pattern, I think is critical going forward. And we still have to deal with, you know, we have security and we have performance management, we have ops and operation, DevOps integration, all these problems to solve, but the fundamental issue is going to be the data. Yeah, exactly. And so if you could go to the next slide. Um, now, what are some of the uh, concerns or needs that we have heard our customers? Um, the slide needs to have a build. I'm not sure uh, if you could build it out all the way, uh, please. Um, what are we hearing from customers across the globe around uh, need for advanced data management? The first and foremost is we need to make sure that data, where you know people talk about data being the new oil and you know 
data and insights are being the uh, line of sight to the critical uh, core competency of organizations, et cetera. So you need to absolutely make sure that data is secure, at rest, in flight, et cetera. And data is also vulnerable to corruption. So how do you make sure that in the event of um, uh, data getting corrupted, there is a graceful way to get back to um, a normal state? Um, or if you look at uh, the whole focus on DevOps and agility at scale uh, from an organization perspective, any delays that uh, comes when it comes a provisioning perspective, because you're keeping anything data, data specific outside the scope of Kubernetes, is definitely uh, a productivity killer for the organization. Or when you're talking about productivity of developers and collaboration between uh, Dev and Tess and the DevOps team, including apps and data is uh, critical, right? So, so, so these are all definitely either hygiene factors or functional requirements that don't come into picture unless you have advanced data management capabilities. And if you had these hygiene factors, then you can start focusing on, okay, how do I get to the SLAs that I need to deliver? Because all the infrastructure investment is ultimately about being able to deliver the application SLAs and then doing that in a way there's no lock-in, right? So these are all uh, multiple facets of requirements that we've heard customers, uh, be it financial powerhouses or travel majors or technology houses um, express to us in their Kubernetes journey because they are, they've long crossed the stage of, hey, is Kubernetes is something that we are betting on. They're betting on it for sure. Now, how do we bring in more workloads so that the value that is brought in by the Kubernetes bet is in, increased and the IT organization is actually being able to deliver even more value on the investment than the bet and the tacit knowledge that the organization has gained around running a Kubernetes um, um, infrastructure. So if you could go to the uh, next slide and, you know, David, uh, I would like to get your thoughts as well after I cover the other side of the coin, which is, Hey, if we did um, um, uh, capabilities or data management capabilities right when it comes to uh, stateful applications, how will that world look like? And this is a, an attempt at painting that picture. Uh, the good news is we are able to deliver that today. And I would like to hear your thoughts on um, um, how you see customers uh, reacting to that. Now, so first and foremost, you know, back to the point about the importance of security, clearly enterprise-grade security is important, and this translates into encryption at rest, encryption during transfer, et cetera. And in addition to that, being able to dock into native you know, access control and security policies that um, um, are around Kubernetes um, um, uh, from a tooling perspective. So that's important. And in addition to that, Capabilities such as being able to take snapshot, being able to move those snapshots around or clone them, rehydrate them in a different place. All those are important to make sure that if data gets corrupted or the worst case, if data and application where to keel over, you have a way to uh, gracefully come back to where uh, business is as usual, right? Now, the other uh, capability that's also important is in an environment where DevOps and speed of thought is being converted into code and then, you know, converted into production, um, how do you make sure that the development team and test teams all operate in like GitHub push-pull model for landscapes or development stacks that they are working on? So there are organizations that we are um, engaged with from a Robin perspective who are saying, hey, look, we have multiple hundred different stacks of, um, uh, you know, vertical stacks, which is made up of multiple elements, um, which developers are using to produce software in their software factory at any point in time, depending on is it a request for a repro or is it a, you know, request for checking a grade and compatibility, there is need to go back in time and recreate these um, landscapes. So, in, to enable such scenarios and enable agile developer collaboration, you need data management capabilities as well. So these are some of the um, uh, you know, must-have capabilities that 
we have heard customers articulate uh, repeatedly, and we are pretty pretty excited about the fact that Robin is in a position to deliver that as well. So, David, um, your thoughts on either rank, rank order importance of these capabilities, or what are you hearing customers say? Yeah, I just want to get the, the audience focused on hybrid and multi-cloud flexibility. I think that really needs to be on the critical path of any kind of solutions that they, you know, think of going forward. And the reality is that that's becoming a platform unto itself. So it has, heterog has heterogeneity in it, obviously, because different cloud brands are in there. But the ability to, in essence, abstract yourself away from the systems that make you dependent on a particular cloud and get into an architecture that's agnostic among the different cloud brands, even some of the on-premise systems that are out there, is going to be the path to success. I think if we're, we're trying to lock into a particular cloud brand and really kind of expecting that to be a strategic direction going forward, we're missing the best of breed opportunities out there. We're not leveraging the right native systems uh, for a particular application. So I just wanted to highlight that as something that, that we can't underestimate. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for highlighting that, David. And, you know, the, clearly to us that translates in many ways into implementing cleanly around Kubernetes, right? So everything that you know, we have done, both in terms of partnership with Google, as well as our offerings, um, the design principle is, you know, API first, right? So that um, the ability to mix and match and being able to uh, not be in the way of uh, portability um, is critical. Now, if you could go to the next slide, um, I'd like to um, highlight uh, some of the uh, benefits that advanced data management, when done right, will look, right? So today, um, anybody uh, can fire up one of the 30 odd, you know, at last counts, CSI certified, CNC, CF uh, certified storage solutions in your Kubernetes farm, and then either create or stand up, uh, let's say for example, a Postgres database. No uh, a big deal, right? That's a table stakes. Now, the what ifs are, hey, what about data management if you know something were to keel over? How do you make sure that there's no performance issues or noisy neighbor issues? How do you make sure that um, uh, you know the clones are application aware, right? These are all gaps that exist when if you go with any of those vendors. But if you went with a cloud native storage that has been architected from design from ground up to meet the requirements uh, that we just talked about, you know, the advanced data management capabilities, as well as the ability to offer to developers without having to stand in the proverbial line outside the storage admin's office to get capabilities using native Kubernetes commands, if you could bring powerful capabilities such as snapshots, cloning, quality of service, push and pull and you know, move across cloud, then we are um, fundamentally liberating or enabling the ability to onboard a whole new set of workloads onto uh, Kubernetes and um, in turn, uh, supercharged Kubernetes itself, right? So, so we, you know, mighty excited about uh, the possibilities that is unfolding in front of our customers, and we are also excited about the early engagements and uh, proof of concepts that we are engaged with uh, customers across the globe around it. Um, I'd like to, you know, maybe spend a minute to call out three aspects which I would call out as must think about when uh, customers are evaluating container native storage, uh, when it, uh, especially addressing stateful workloads. Um, first is, uh, you know, thanks to the innovation that's happening in the Kubernetes community, the Kubernetes infrastructure is beginning to understand what an application is. You know, a Helm chart, for example, is one way of abstracting and letting know that, hey, you know, there is something more than just a bunch of images, right? Or an operator has got a set of intelligence. So ideally, you need to be able to bring data management capabilities to that construct and not regress back and go back to volume level management, et cetera. So, so clearly, uh, if you can bring advanced data management on top of Helm and on top of um, um, you know, so much so I would say, hey, if you got Helm for an app, if you could bring advanced data management to address lifecycle management, 
then I think you are picking a winner in terms of uh, a solution. The second one is something that I think David flagged as well. You know, multi-cloud portability is very important, and that's predicated on some fundamental principles around API adherence and uh, uh, driving standards, et cetera. So in this case, uh, everything that we've implemented is around CSI, and in fact, we're mighty excited about the partnership that uh, we announced at Google Next, whereby we're partnering with Google Cloud to define the uh, what it means to be the state-of-the-art APIs for data management around Kubernetes. And our belief is that these APIs will become, like how SQL became the standard for data access, these will become the advanced data management uh, standard APIs from a, a Kubernetes perspective. Um, and then the third and important one, and you know, often forgotten aspect is, uh, make sure that there's no performance penalty just because you're bringing in the stateful workloads onto Kubernetes, right? So, um, and to get to that, what we have done is to design from ground up a, a storage system, a block storage solution. Now, there are uh, solutions out there that build on top of, uh, you know, historically architected solutions, and so they suffer from penalty. You know, if you built on top of ButterFS, guess what? You know, you lose the ability over where data is stored because ButterFS is managing that, right? So um, clearly uh, choosing a solution wherein you're not losing out on performance and in fact gaining if you can would be uh, important as, um, as well. So um, um, so net -net, um, uh, just to summarize uh, what I'd uh, covered, Clearly, advanced data management capabilities are required to onboard stateful applications to Kubernetes. And from an evaluation perspective, we need to look at solutions that can deliver app plus data or application consistent capabilities as well as high level of performance. And then last but not the least, um, you know, future proofing guarantee uh, through clean API implementation. So David, um, any thoughts on this um, um, or any questions or comments? No, I think you nailed it. Excellent, so I guess then I hand it back to you for a poll question that we had. Yeah, we'll go ahead and do a poll and, and this is gonna be a, a, actually a question I'm very interested in getting people's responses. What do containers bring to your enterprise? Uh, portability, scalability, security, all of the above. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and launch that poll and you can take some time to fill it out. We're going to talk about it in a minute. Uh, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, what is going to be returned from the poll and what we're going to be more interested in. Yeah, the, the technically correct answer has to be, I think, all of the above, although I would suspect portability might be the, uh, the winner. Any bets that you're making? <laughs> Yeah, I think it will be all of the above, and I think that's, uh, you know, but I think it'd be interesting, you know, as to what percentage that people are kind of weighting that. So it's going to be, a hundred, you know, 50% 50, 50 portability, 25% scalability, you know, 25% security, you know, those sorts of things. And I think that, uh, you know, that may be, um, you know, something that I'd be interested in as well. But I think that ultimately these are the three reasons that people leverage containers. And so portability used to be the battle cry containers. Uh, you know, a few years ago when it first started. And I think that uh, we got into scalability with container orchestration such as Kubernetes and then solved the security problem. And now we have the ability to deal with data, the ability to deal with governance, the ability to deal with all these sorts of things which were difficult to deal with in containers. And, and containers have their own ecosystem now. And so just a number of products that are able to solve some of these issues. And so just go ahead and throw the results up there since you have them. And uh, we're going to go ahead and see if we are, our assumptions are correct. So it looks like all of the above 59%, but if we're looking at kind of the second choice, uh, I think it was portability and scalability and security. Uh, and security, that's kind of um, either concerning or, or uh, you know, surprising that, that it, uh, you know, was, was not considered as much. So what's your take on the responses here? Yeah, I think that this might be one of those, you know, they say about cloud, depending on who you ask, security is either the concern or the very reason that they are <laughs> moving to cloud. And I would extend the same construct to uh, containers and Kubernetes as well, right? Given the strong correlation between cloud and containers. Uh, if done right, I, you know, you know, the very fact that you can architect applications and uh, in a tightly secure manner is an advantage, but I guess the concern might be, you know, when you're bringing in 
historically architected. Anything that was architected before five years, um, you know, is not container native, right? So how do you make sure that those get the, you know, security um, 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 hygiene factors uh, could be was potentially a concern area? Yeah, I think that, uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you a, a, probably a tougher question. Uh, if, the pri if the larger cloud brands are promoting containers basically as a way to deal with portability, you know, kind of does, doesn't that go against the business model if they're trying to keep people on their cloud service uh, versus uh, allowing them to build things that are going to be portable among clouds? Or is this uh, just something that we're uh, we're heading toward as a you know almost as a cloud culture, and therefore we need to embrace it to kind of uh, you know provide uh, with the, what the end user is looking for? Yeah, I think my observation, you know, purely as an industry participant here, is that if there is no uh, collective embrace of multi-cloud and portability, there's going to be a tension between the big cloud providers and the ISV ecosystem. We've seen sort of you know, evidences of that. I think that the best norm position is everybody sort of uh, supports hybrid uh, and multi-cloud, but you try to retain through value and not through uh, technical limitation because that's going to make you look a, look like a lock-in that everybody's trying to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's put this away and move on to the presentation. We're going to have another poll question for the end. One more. So understand Google hybrid and multi-cloud strategy and explore new solutions that have just been announced that may change the game and how you build, deploy, and operate containers. And so obviously Google Anthos is out there and it's among other various systems that have similar patterns and not exactly the same. What was interesting about that announcement was the fact that um, it was uh, something that was cloud agnostic by a cloud provider. And I think that's uh, you know maybe a game-changing kind of take in terms of how we're moving into the market. and. You know, kudos to, you know, kudos for all the people who thought that up. I think that's going to be a winning strategy. So what are your comments or thoughts on that announcement? Well, right on the money, right? So back to the point we were talking about multi-cloud becoming a default expectation from a customer perspective, uh, a cloud provider delivering on that promise or promising to deliver on that is uh, a fantastic. Kudos to the team. We're excited clearly about being part of uh, uh, the journey that uh, can unfold as part of our partnership with Google um, as well. Now, uh, again, while the intent has been announced, we haven't seen uh, uh, the experience on the other clouds uh, uh, from Google. So, you know, I'm, um, as a technologist, I'm keen to uh, experience that as well, and then, um, um, you know, uh, look forward to uh, the journey thereof. Absolutely. Let's move to the next slide, please. So Google Anthos, and let's kind of break it down in terms of some of the capabilities that are there. And uh, I, I did, you know, podcast about it, and I, you know, that was able to kind of, um, you know, talk to, you know, people who were, you know, looking at this technology as kind of viable technology for their enterprises, and pretty excited about it. And the ability to have a containerized infrastructure, microservice management, you know, with the on-premise systems, and move it directly, you know, into the cloud in almost a drag-and-drop way. You know, it was something actually was promised back, you know, as far back as 2010, uh, when people were talking about hybrid cloud solutions, just nothing really worked well. And the reality is that they weren't open source things, they weren't open technology, people had their own proprietary things, you know, and therefore they had limitations on what you could do with that technology, not mentioning names here. So this seems to be kind of a step in the direction that people are doing, looking for a couple of things. Number one, open source technology that's going to be uh, extendable by different ecosystem players in the in the uh, open source world, in this case Anthos, but we could talk about, you know, any open source players. The ability to kind of leverage, uh, you know, architectural patterns that are really helpful, um, containers, and we've, we've kind of, you know, beat the value of that to death by, you know, this part of the presentation, but we know it's going to be valuable. But the ability also to deal with microservice management, the ability to deal with governance, the ability to deal with security, storage, you know, data management really kind of in a self-contained environment that's going to be transportable in a, a mega easy way on whether you're on premise or in the cloud. But I think more people are going to leverage this cloud to cloud. They're going to move it, you know, between different cloud brands and even managed service providers and colo providers, things like that. So to me, this is 
exciting news because it's getting to the nirvana of things that were promised years ago that really weren't delivered. Uh, but now we're seeming to be at a point in the second lot of adoption and certainly with the cloud saturation being about 20 to 30 percent in terms of workloads where this is going to be a viable opportunity. And this couldn't come at a better time because I think that people are migrating massive amounts of application workloads in the cloud, tens of thousands of things in some of these various enterprises. And so now they have to make a decision in terms of the, you know, the R's, whether you re refactor, rewrite, redo, replace, you know, those sorts of things. And we have a new option here, the ability to, in essence, put it into a portability domain. And in many instances, not necessarily kick the ball down the road, but have cloud native capabilities we're able to provide with as little refactoring uh, that as possible, you know, without, you know, uh, not doing the right things from an architectural standpoint. Uh, this seems to fill in all those things. And of course, you know, yet to test it and yet to get into production. And we kind of have to live with this technology for a while. But um, what's your take on that, on Google Anthos? Uh, absolutely. Plus one to several of the positives that you called out, right? It clearly, it, 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 the timing is right in terms of uh, uh, when um, um, it is being made available. To me, the exciting, um, uh, like to the point that you mentioned around massive migration underway, the fact that you could get to a cloud native footprint um, either on-prem or um, in the cloud and then slowly over a period of time eventually move all the way to you know everything to the cloud if that you know if you choose to be is a, a fantastic or move it to any other cloud too. So that's such a powerful um, a promise and everything is tied to one, you know, to, to, to a couple of things, right? One is there's nothing proprietary of this layer, uh, which gives comfort that there is no vendor locking that's underway. Uh, so open source innovation and it at its best and delivered with the managed experience, which is fantastic. Secondly, if you look at the ecosystem that has been, uh, that was um, highlighted and we were excited to be part of uh, uh, that, uh, consists of open source database solutions to some of the traditional um, um, players such as VMware, et cetera, which make sure that you know workloads that are today potentially on VMware could be migrated over to this um, in a much more seamless manner, right? So, uh, so these I see um, as positives for reducing the friction in the eyes of the customer and in other words bodes well for uptick of or uptake of um, anthos as a solution um, in the minds of customers so so let, let's put you in the enterprise space you're a cio of a, uh, a large global 2000 enterprise and you're looking at this technology what would be the most concerning thing as uh, you have projects that are setting directions you know, toward this technology and this play, what would what would be some of the questions you would ask the team to ensure that they pay special attention to uh, to make sure we don't run into obstacles here? Yeah. So look, now we're talking about uh, enterprise workloads. Uh, these are not uh, fancy uh, some you know ex experiments alone, right? So 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 given that. The classical um, enterprise uh, vendor evaluation criteria, which range from being able to uh, uh, deliver on the solution to supportability, you know, th that would be uh, very important, right? I'm at the risk of stating the obvious, because th you're not going after some shiny new thing, you're going after um, a very informed decision-making process around onboarding existing workloads, which are probably either in physical or potentially virtualized onto this platform, right? So, so that's important. The second, um, I think there's a, um, um, aspects to clearly think through both from a cost, security, uh, a privacy perspective. Um, those aspects are, um, uh, they leave the cost aspect aside, um, especially if you're using you know, multiple clouds. How does that you know, translate to, is it a saving? Is it a net new? You know, how will my billing look like, et cetera? Those haven't been answered. So I think you need to have a good worldview of but what does it do to my TCO, um, um, especially in a multi-cloud footprint, right? So you need to have a good concrete set of answers um, around that one. And then um, a third um, um, aspect that I was uh, touching upon is around the, well, what is the um, implement security implementation in its um, entirety? Um, and 
it, how much of a how-to guidance is being provided by um, uh, Google's um, uh, Fable, either SRV engagements, et cetera, um, and how can that scale will be all uh, questions that I would uh, um, uh, be uh, thinking about if I'm in the hot shoes of a CIO thinking about Anthos. Yeah, one more question. I think some, a lot of, that's on the, uh, I think the brains of a lot of people who are, you know, uh, listening to this webinar or even attending the webinar live right now is what about the container tax? And what I'm talking about when we're looking at containerizing existing applications or even building net new applications, there's a bit more work that has to be done. Certainly some of the architectural planning, the way in which you design the systems. You know, it's, we're, it's not a lift and shift kind of technology. Think that some thinking has to go into how we deal with those. So what would your sense be? Is the container tax going to be lowered? Is it going to be negative at some point? You know, where are we going in the next few years in terms of cost payout? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And it's a journey towards getting to, you know, a negative or a zero uh, container cost, right? As more tacit knowledge and um, you know organizational uh, uh, capability improves around it, as well as truth be told, um, you know some of the provouts around scale and performance, et cetera, for more demanding workloads have to happen as well. But overall, I'm you know definitely on the you know bullish on the positive side that you know this is a train that's you know definitely moving in one set direction. So how fast uh, uh, is it going to move? Is how I interpret your question. So from that perspective, uh, some of the work that we are doing, for example, right, in, in our own removing the friction when it comes to being able to onboard stateful workloads, that addresses a whole new zip code of applications that can benefit from the value. So uh, value of uh, what this is going to um, bring to the table, right? So so I think there is a huge potential to unlock the value use the introduction of a technology such as this to um, you know clearly uh, to, to the point that you were alluding to get a good view of the application footprint the the, the whole ta taxonomization in terms of how far uh, how, how aggressive are you going to be in terms of moderniz modernization versus keeping it as is but anything that is you know either halfway near the modernization mark clearly uh, can benefit from um, uh, containerization. And uh, uh, to some of the points that you had made, uh, David, earlier, I think uh, Google is uh, offering a credible alternative for customers to take a look at. Yeah, I'm just yeah. sitting down, writing down article ideas coming out of this. And I'm, I'm just, you know, lots of little angles in terms of how we're thinking, you know, differently about this technology, how we're leveraging the good, bad, and the ugly. There's more good than bad. Um, but there is considerations in terms of architectural sophistication, the skill sets to, you know, think differently and kind of how we make the next, you know, create the next generation cloud-based technology. So Google hybrid and multi-cloud strategy. And so going forward, you know, Anthos seems to be, you know, we, we talked about this early in the presentation. We're not going to dwell too much on it here, you know, but into the fact that they support, you know, all platforms, the ability to on-premise and cloud brands and, you know, I'm sure at some point in time we'll talk about mobility and we'll talk about, uh, you know, even having Anthos, uh, you know, aspects of Anthos running on drone technology and IoT technology. Not that that's announced, but, you know, it seems like that's going to be a logical collusion for this technology. So without getting too much into superlatives here, you know, where is this stuff going to go and how quickly do you think it's going to go into kind of the multi-cloud platform area? Yeah, so at least based on what we heard at Google Next, the, 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 the spokespersons claim you know thousands of customers expressing um, early interest in um, Anthos, right? I mean, this is before they went GA. So if anything, Google Next is uh, would have set the, uh, this as uh, um, I would say in the top five list of uh, um, uh, tire kicking that um, um, I would expect. CIO, CTO organizations to be um, embarking on. We are uh, to, my, to the point that I'd made um, earlier, we're beginning to, on our own little ways, beginning to see some of the early demand signals uh, from customers as well. So, so I think um, um, all in all, this bodes well for broad-based evaluation by um, enterprise customers, which is, I believe, the, the bet behind um, the move itself. Yep, awesome. So let's get into the next uh, 
next section here, learn how to hide complexity while providing and maintaining richness of capability. And these seems to be uh, contra, you know, contradictory kinds of objectives that we're looking into. The more I'm dealing with things that uh, in hiding complexity, uh, the more I'm kind of reducing capability. So if you're thinking of the olden days when we used to deal with portability um, before containers and before distributed objects and, you know, all these old old things that, uh, you know, old guys like re me remember, uh, the deal was if we went to least common denominator approaches to anything, and in mm -hmm. essence, uh, you know, containers do that at one level, the trade-off is we, we don't run well anywhere. And your ability to, in essence, um, you know, remove complexity, remove some of the native things, abstract them away from the core piece of the technology is going to have some trade-off down the road. Are we, what are we getting away with now? Yeah, I think uh, you're touching on something which uh, um, an area where I think out of the possible has improved or changed. Let me explain what I mean by that. Typically, you know, you would let's take API layers, let's take CSI, which is the um, storage uh, standard interface layer that's been uh, supported by CNCF for Kubernetes as well as other orchestrators if you're interested in other orchestrators. So there's a standard way to bring in storage into a Kubernetes um, uh, environment. Now, a traditional view would be, hey, look, this is the least common denominator approach and hence, if you had innovation, you won't be able to shine through that. But reality is, if you go back to the, the, the engineering to engineering collaboration that we are doing with Google, the very thing that we are doing with Google is to make sure that while it is CSI, think of it as CSI++, we are still able to shine through additional capabilities. Now, clearly the API set will become a commodity, so anybody who has implemented that can get the benefit of that, but the reality is not everybody has the same starting point in terms of you know the stacks that they have implemented, right? So all I'm you know I'm making a case for is that you can um, hide complexity and at the same time provide richness of capability if you've architected for that, right? How elegant is the architecture that your solution is uh, built on is going to determine the degrees of latitude or degrees of freedom you're going to gain, both in terms of being able to reduce complexity as well as um, maintaining richness of capability. Uh, it, did, did that make sense? A little bit of a longish answer, David, and I, at the risk of maybe a little bit pedantic as well, but did that answer your question? Yeah, it does, I and I think that, that the, 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 rea the reality is this stuff's comp complicated. I don't think there is an easy answer to this, um, but certainly it's getting more clear, I think, as the technology is evolving. Let's go to the next slide, please. And we'll get into our next poll question. In this case, it's going to be, how do you hide enterprise IT complexity? Uh, containers, which we're talking about here, cloud management platforms, and they've been around for a while, serverless-based systems, or something else. And go ahead, we'll give you about 30, 40 seconds to respond. Uh, so what's your take on this? What do you think is gonna be the number one answer? So I, I think if you look at the state of where today's customers' uh, conversations are, I would say cloud management platforms uh, would be the number one pick. But if you're going by the hype of where the future is, uh, you know, serverless. So I'm, you know, potentially saying number one CMP, number two serverless. Let's see what the audience says. Your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be containers number one. Uh, I think uh, we agree on that. And serverless number two, and then uh, cloud management platforms number three. And the reality is that um, you know serverless can actually cause complexity uh, if you use it in the wrong way. Uh, cloud management platforms can typically abstract you away from it. And containers kind of do both. They'll provide you with a development platform and the ability to deal with complexity and the ability to deal with distributed systems. You know, but there is that added effort that comes along. And I think it's really kind of a skill set thing. So when we get the results. Let's go ahead and put them up. Love to see where we're going here, and especially uh, some of the some of the research I'm doing. And cloud management platforms. How do you hide complexity? How do you hide IT complexity? So currently, they're leveraging CMP, and uh, they're not typically leveraging containers. 
Um, and then also they're leveraging serverless as well and it's a few people leveraging something else. So this doesn't surprise me, but it does surprise me that, uh, you know, containers came in third after serverless, but I guess this is current use. Uh, so we're not talking about things in the future, but cloud management platforms are really kind of the number one way in which people are dealing with complexity. Are you finding that in, within your customer base? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, to point, if you had asked, how do you plan to hide your IT complexity over the next few years, the answer might be very different. Uh, I think this is re more reflective of where um, the puck is, as it were. Yeah, and it's interesting, because I, I think if we're going to do this poll, um, you know, in three years, uh, containers will be number one, serverless will be number two, cloud management platforms will probably morph into something that's different. Uh, and then something else will be, you know, least common I mean, approach and all the other, you know, things that may not be working as well. Um, and maybe I'm too bullish on containers as the ability to kind of solve lots of issues. But the reason I am is because we can control them more. And so in other words, server, cloud management platforms are indeed a platform, but they're static in terms of the behavior and the feature functions they're providing you. And so you have to depend on them to change the systems. Containers, really, you're dealing with a true platform that can be, uh, manipulate it any way you want to manipulate it and still provide the portability and things like that. And then there's also new technology that's sitting on top of it. And also aspects of Anthos are indeed a cloud management platform. So we're kind of blurring the lines. What are your thoughts before we move on? Yeah, I, I, spot on. I couldn't agree more, um, um, David. Let's uh, um, look at the next slide, I guess. Yeah, let's put this away and head on. So moving on, we ask us the question, dealing with IT complexity, and you know, why is IT so complex? Um, ultimately, if this is an area of focus that I've been studying for the last two or three years, because I just kind of see this as a big obstacle and has been successful with cloud. We moved you know, a couple of hundred applications to the cloud and we increased the number of endpoints. We're typically not eliminating some of the on-premise systems at the same time. And so we're dealing with more endpoints and more complexity. And at the same time, IT is being asked to reduce budget and reduce, uh, increase the use of technology to automate things. And we're at a, at a crossroads here where the number of complexity is starting to uh, accelerate and would, you know, inflecting, say, um, and our ability to deal with complexity probably isn't as well understood to kind of keep up. So we're, we're heading for a tipping point. You know where that tipping point is and what IT is going to do about it. I think this is going to be a 2020 issue, uh, but it's coming. What are your thoughts on this? Absolutely, I, and, and at least I've heard a few CIOs uh, express ruthless automation as the um, antidote to anything complex, right? So, I mean, there's definitely merit to it, right? So, um, but I also wholeheartedly agree with uh, your assessment and point of view that the complexity, if anything, is only going to increase. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So multi-cloud drives increased complexity, and we are looking at hitting a tipping point at some point. And I think that that's going to drive, you know, lots of enterprises to kind of revisit many of the concepts we're talking about here. And so if we're dealing with containers and containerization, you know, certainly in the newer tools and technologies such as Anthos, the ability to deal with stateful based systems, the ability to deal with data management, the ability to deal with these tactical issues and do so in a sustainable way, you know, is really going to be the push rather quickly. So do you think when we do hit this tipping point, do you think it will be noticed? Or do you think this will be something that's, you know, covered with it by the tech press? Or do you think this is going to be just, uh, you know, fire drills that occur within enterprise IT? Yeah, well, unfortunately, this the, the you know the graph is more complex than we are choosing to show it. In that, uh, there there are multiple uh, things happening at the same time, right? Um, and I'm referring to the fact that we also have help coming in the way of you know more AI and automation, intelligent learning, automation capabilities uh, uh, kicking in. I know we are very early in the uh, adoption curve of uh, some of those systems, but um, um, uh, as you characterize, this problem is, you know, little, you know, we can kick it down the can, kick the can little down the road of, you know, let's say a couple of years. And, and I believe some of the technologies uh, uh, such as AI and machine learning can help alleviate some of these uh, challenges. 
Absolutely. All right, next slide, please. So let's get into Q&A, and we have about eight minutes to do that. And we got, let's uh, go ahead. I got a number of questions here, but I'm going to go ahead and take the top three. Um, you know, any use cases, uh, this is directly from the live audience here, e-commerce or content management platforms, Anthos with Robin has been tested against? The, the, I think I think that, yeah, that'll take that question. Um, so let, let me pull back a little bit and give a, a bit more context on Robin and our competency. Prior to the Kubernetes pivot in August, uh, Robin for the last you know, three plus four or nearly four years has been focused on containerized stateful applications. So examples include, uh, we have a travel major that has got 400 Oracle rack servers containerized and managed using, you know, a Robin platform. We have a, a security and networking major with multiple petabytes of data that they have virtualized, uh, containerized and manage using Robin platform, et cetera, right? So, so these are um, addressed using our solution called Robin platform, which is a combination of the storage solution we touched upon in our discussion today, as well as some networking capabilities and some application management capabilities. So from that perspective, yes, we have um, addressed multiple workloads, include, con including content management solutions, et cetera. Now, the way to contextualize Robin storage as an offering is we're taking the know-how and the learning that we got from, you know, being uh, able to run crazy workloads on uh, Kubernetes. You know, people don't believe when we say that, look, we have uh, 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 400 Oracle rack servers on containers and, you know, it's in production. You know, it's been in production for, you know, um, uh, more than a year or so, right? So. And um, so we've taken all that know-how and then bringing in, um, in terms of data management capabilities for Robin storage in Google context. So the, the journey in terms of testing these workloads um, uh, is just in front of us. So um, I'm confident that the architecture and um, our solution uh, will support that. Would love to engage directly with the customer. Um, uh, contact us, go to robin.io. Happy to engage in any uh, shape or form. So I got a kind of good question that I take. What other tools are available for hybrid and multi-cloud management? And I think the reality is that there's there's just uh, different categories of tool systems out there, and we're typically going to have to leverage a suite of things uh, in order to kind of remove ourselves away from the complexity. There's cloud management platforms that we talked about containers and container-based orchestration, serverless and serverless-based orchestration. And we have cloud service brokers and we have security-based systems such as identity access management that's able to deal with security, you know, at the distributed level, just a multitude of things. So it's it's one of those questions where the answer is that really you need to level this down to the patterns that you're looking for. And so it is a cloud management platform the cloud management platform that leverages containers in the case of Anthos, you know, that's that's kind of what that is. And then what sort of tactical tools that you need once you pick your ma your macro solution uh, to kind of fill in the blanks, uh, the ability to deal with stateful applications, databases, security, you know, directly from inside the container. So you're really getting into an architecture to get to an architecture. So you're, what you're doing is, in essence, looking at number of clouds that are there, the cloud brands that are there, the types of applications that are there, and then you can kind of back the technology, the appropriate technology into those things. The, the kicker would be the fact that you don't know where you're gonna be in five years. I, I know people think they know, and they kind of have a notion or a vision as to where they're gonna go. They think they're gonna be a single cloud provider or two cloud providers. Typically, it's gonna be more complex and heterogeneic, heterogeneous than you think. And your ability to kind of pick something that's much more flexible, uh, that can be malleable to adapt itself around your needs going forward are gonna be your best bet. Anything to add to this? I thought you covered a, a broad spectrum, maybe just to underscore uh, the heterogeneity part, right? So heterogeneity is gonna be a given. And so uh, uh, how, how not just from a, uh, uh, technology perspective, but also from people process perspective, you know, what are the skilling requirements needed to deal with all of that? It, it, there's got to be uh, uh, plans. Or 
if not a conscious strategy towards managed as a way to bring in these technology, but still uh, not have to deal with uh, uh, kind of the day-to-day -day complexity, et cetera. So, so you know, I think there, there, there's tremendous opportunity to uh, start uh, fine-tuning or, or charting the cores um, of this five-year five -year journey that you were just uh, alluding to, David. Absolutely. One last question, and then we're going to go ahead and call it. Uh, what is the future of hybrid cloud and multi-cloud in terms of security? And I think you addressed security as part of your presentation, so I'll give that one to you. Um, I touched a, a little bit of that, which, which was more contextual to from a community's perspective and our storage offering perspective. Uh, how are we addressing that? We are essentially docking into the uh, 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 you know native Kubernetes security uh, uh, frameworks. Um, but the, I guess the question is more of you know in a hybrid context, what are the security ramifications? And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a an hour's topic of uh, discussion uh, in itself. Um, and I, um, I think I would think um, it will boil down to some of the you know security first principles when it comes to application design um, uh, delivery, which uh, 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 become all the more important when you're talking about you know twelve factor microservices application. You know what is the impact of uh, security design principles there, right? So how does your development uh, uh, um, uh, dev to DevOps environment take into account and operationalize that, right? So that's a a very very important um, subject in itself and then outside that from an infrastructure perspective i believe and david i would like to uh, hear your view as the uh, 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 an analyst uh, on the call i think from an infrastructure perspective all the cloud providers have done a phenomenal job of trying to uh, uh, innovate as well as deliver the peace of mind in being able to uh, meet where the customers are in terms of their security needs uh, is my point of view. Uh, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I, we got to call it there. We're out of time. Uh, where can, last uh, piece of information, where can we find uh, Rob and I on the web and uh, what kinds of uh, things you want people to study? Yeah, straightforward. You know, please uh, go to www.robin.io to learn about um, our product offerings. Also, I encourage you to go um, try um, our Robin storage solution available on Google Cloud Marketplace, especially if you're a Google customer or um, in the process of evaluating Anthos. Uh, thirdly, um, if you want to have a, a more technical discussion or a follow-up discussion, uh, contact us via the uh, web form that is available on our website as well. Somebody will be happy to get in touch with you pronto. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David, for uh, uh, the opportunity to participate with you, and uh, thank you, audience, for participating as well. Thank you very much for participating, and also thank you very much for sponsoring this webinar. Thanks, you, thank you all for attending this webinar. I hope you learned something. I certainly did, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Take care.